Here's lesson four of the exponential functions unit. In this lesson, I'm just going to show you some properties of exponential functions. We're gonna analyze a few exponential functions and state properties such as domain, range, intervals of increase and decrease, and asymptotes. Let's start with example one, where it asks us for all that information for the function y equals four times a half to the power of x. In order to state all that information, it would be useful if we figured out what the graph of this function looks like. So let's make a table of values so that we can graph it. For my independent variable x, I will choose whatever x values I want. So I will choose x values from negative 3 to 3 because I know that will give me a good representation of the shape of this exponential function. I can then calculate the y values by taking each of these x values and subbing them in for x in the exponential equation, and that will tell me the value of y. Let me start by subbing in negative 3 for x. So I would have 4 times a half to the power of negative 3. Knowing my exponent rules, I know that's the same as doing 4 times 2 to the positive 3, which is 4 times 8, which is 32. So my first y value is 32. If I plugged in negative 2, I'd have 4 times a half to the negative 2, which is the same as 4 times 2 squared, which is 16. What I want you to notice is, to get from my first y value to my second y value, it was cut in half. And why did that happen? Well, that's because the base of the power is a half. So my next y value just cut 16 and a half, it's going to be eight. And we could calculate that by subbing negative one into the equation for x, but I noticed the pattern. So I'm just going to keep cutting my y values in half, four, two, one, and 0 0.5. So now I'm going to plot all of these points. On the y-axis, I'm going to make my scale go by twos, but I'll label every other spot. And my x-axis, I'll go by ones. The point negative 332 doesn't fit on my graph based on the scale I chose, but I can plot the rest of the points. I'll do that quickly. And you can imagine if I continued my table of values, so if I figured out what the y value was when x was 4, it will be half of 0.5, which is 0.25. And then when x is 5, it'll be half of 0.25, which is 0.125. And I'll keep cutting those y values in half, and they're never going to get to zero. There'll always be something left, which is why this function has a horizontal asymptote at y equals zero. So let me sketch that. So this function's y value can never get to zero. Now that I see the graph of this function, I can state its properties. The domain of this function, well, the function will continue forever to the right and also forever to the left. So there are no restrictions on the domain. Algebraically, I could sub anything I want in for x and be able to get a value for y. So the domain we say x is an element of real numbers. The range, however, Notice if we're thinking vertically, where does this function exist? The function is always above zero. It's never below the x-axis. So for the range, we say y can be any real number given it's greater than zero. The y values of every point on the function are always going to be greater than zero. The x-intercept, well, the function never crosses the x-axis, so we'd say none, but the y-intercept if I look at my graph, the y-intercept, it crosses the y-axis at four. Intervals of increase, decrease. Well, exponential functions are either always increasing or always decreasing. We define increasing or decreasing based on as x is increasing, what's happening to y. So if I look at my table of values, as the x values are getting bigger, what's happening to the y values? They're getting smaller. And graphically, as the function moves from left to right, is it going down or up? it's going down to the right. So for both of those reasons, we would say this is a decreasing function. It's decreasing over its entire domain. Asymptotes, there is a horizontal asymptote at y equals zero. There's the properties of that function. A couple things I want you to notice. I want you to notice that the y-intercept shows up in the equation right there, and that the pattern in consecutive y values is determined by the base of the power. So let's pay attention to those patterns as we continue these questions. Part B is negative three to the negative x. Let me actually rewrite that equation a little bit. That negative that you see in front of the three, right here, is not part of the base of the power. So I'm gonna make that clear by writing it as a negative one, and then putting the base of the power three beside it in brackets. And the exponent is negative x. We can actually make the exponent positive, right now it's negative, I can make it positive if I do the reciprocal of the base. So instead of three, make the base one over three, and then I can change the exponent to positive. So let me make that adjustment. So that equation is equivalent to what the question gave us, but it's going to help us see the pattern in the properties of this function a lot better. 
let's graph this function. Let's choose some x values. I'll choose x values just between negative 2 and 2 for this function. And then let's calculate the corresponding values of y. If I subbed in negative 2 for x into this function, I would have negative 1 times a third to the negative 2. That's the same as negative 1 times 3 to the positive 2, which would be negative 9. If I subbed in negative 1 to this function, negative 1 times a third to the negative 1 is the same as negative 1 times 3 to the positive 1. So that would be negative 3. Hopefully you see what pattern is happening to these consecutive y values. If I multiplied by a third, it would get me the next y value. And that's because the base of the power in our equation here is a third. So my next y value, if I were to calculate it, I would just do negative 3 times a third, which is negative 1. Then the next one will be negative 1 over 3, which I could write as negative 0.33 approximately. And then a third of that, negative 0.11 approximately. I can plot these points. Let me make my scale on my graph. And now let me plot the five points that I have, the first one being negative 2, negative 9. Notice this function is also going to have a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. All exponential functions have that horizontal asymptote at y equals 0, unless we were to shift the function up or down with a c value. So there's a rough sketch of the function. Let's state the properties of it. The domain of any exponential function is x can be any real number. Right, the function goes forever left and forever right. And also, we could sub anything we want in for x into the equation, and we'll get an answer. So the domain, no restrictions, x can be any real number. The range, however, where does this function exist vertically? What y values can the function get? Well, the y values are always less than 0. So we'll say y can be any real number, given that it is less than 0. x-intercepts, it doesn't have any. The y-intercept, I see it crosses the y-axis there at negative 1. And then is this an increasing or decreasing function? So as x is increasing, what's happening to these y values? Notice they are getting bigger. And if I look at the graph, as I move from left to right, the function's going up to the right. So that means it is an increasing function. And the asymptote is still at y equals 0. So once again, the connection I want you to make, notice the y-intercept shows up here in an exponential relationship. And the pattern of what happens to consecutive y values corresponds to the base of the power. Let's move on to example two, where we'll use that relationship I was just talking about to be able to generate the equation in the form y equals a times b to the power of x for the exponential function that we see here in the diagram. Let me start by actually labeling some points on the graph. So I'm going to label some consecutive points. I don't know what the coordinates are there exactly, but this point looks like it's at 1, 6. This point looks like it's at 2, 18. And this point looks like it's at 354. This is at zero, I'm not sure. But if we look at the pattern in the y values, we could probably figure it out. Like look at consecutive y values. If we go from right to left, it goes from 54 down to 18 down to six. It seems to be being multiplied by a third each time. So if I do six times a third, I'm guessing that this next y value is going to be two. I'm not sure, we'll calculate it algebraically to be sure. So let me label in this table of values the points that we have. Now, if we're going to be able to write the equation of this function, hopefully you remember from the first couple of examples we did, I told you the base of the power corresponds to what is the scale factor that gets us from one y value to the next one? What are we multiplying by to get from six to 18? We're multiplying by three. And that same scale factor stays true for each pair of y values times 3. So what y value did we multiply by 3 to get to 6? Well, like I said, we can multiply it by 6 by a third to figure that out, and it is 2. But let's solve it algebraically to be sure. So into our exponential equation, y equals a times b to the power of x, we know the base of our power is 3 because the y values are repeatedly tripling. So I can say y equals a times 3 to the x, and I can sub in any point that is on my exponential relationship for x and y and then solve for a. Let's pick any of the points in our table where we know x and y, so we might as well just pick the point 1, 6. 6 is the y value, and 1 is the x value. And then if I isolate this equation for a, a is 6 over 3, which is 2. So the exponential equation, the a value is 2, like we thought, the base of the power is 3, and our exponent we write as x. That equation defines the relationship between x and y for all points that make up this exponential relationship in the graph.
Let's do another example. Example three says a radioactive sample has a half life. Let me highlight that as a half life of three days. The initial sample is 200 milligrams. Write a function to relate the amount remaining in milligrams to the time in days. Since we want to write uh, an exponential function for this, any exponential function is in the format y equals a times b to the x. And like we've talked about before, a is the initial value and b is the growth or decay factor. So let's start by subbing those and we could say y equals the initial value, it says is 200. And since this is a half-life question, I know that 200 is being cut in half repeatedly. The exponent x is how often it gets cut in half. Well, it gets cut in half once every three days. So my exponent would be the total amount of time divided by three days. That'll tell me how many times to multiply 200 by a half. And we can actually write this in function notation to make it a little more clear that this is a function of time. We can say the amount at time t equals 200 times a half to the t over three. In this box here, let's now summarize how we can tell if an exponential function is increasing or decreasing based on the values of a and b in the exponential relationship. So let me write down the four different possibilities. Let's start with this one here. What if the initial value of the exponential relationship is bigger than zero? So I'll put a point right here. That's where it starts on the y-axis above the x-axis. And the b value is bigger than one. That means the y values are repeatedly getting multiplied by a number bigger than one. So as I move to the right, those y values are going to be getting bigger. So the exponential relationship will look like this. Notice it's going up to the right. Therefore, this is an increasing function. Let's now focus here. What if a is less than zero, but b is bigger than one? So that would mean if a is less than zero, we start on the y-axis below the x-axis down here. And that value is going to get multiplied by a number bigger than one repeatedly. Let's say a is negative two and the b value is two. So that negative two is going to be multiplied by two repeatedly. So it's going to go from negative two to negative four to negative eight. Those values, as I go to the right, are getting smaller. So notice this function is going down to the right, which is why this is a decreasing function. Another thing to notice is that this function is just a vertical reflection of that one. And I should probably sketch in both of these functions have horizontal asymptotes at y equals zero. In these two sections, I have the base of the power being between zero and one. So that means our initial value is repeatedly being multiplied by something that's going to make it smaller. So if a is bigger than zero, that means we start above the x-axis. And as I move to the right, that value repeatedly gets multiplied by something between zero and one. So it's going to make it smaller. So here we have a decreasing function. But if a is less than zero, so it starts below the x-axis, and we re repeatedly multiply that by a value between zero and one, it actually makes the value bigger because it makes the points go higher. It makes them become closer to zero. So that's an increasing function. And notice that that one is just a vertical reflection of that one. So those are the four scenarios. Let's look at some examples where we actually have some numbers and do some rough sketches to figure out if these are increasing or decreasing functions. We won't make a table of values to graph these super accurately. We'll just do a rough sketch. Notice these are all in the format y equals a times b to the x. We've established that a is the initial value. Graphically, that shows up as the y-intercept. And b is the base of the power, which tells us what the initial value is repeatedly being multiplied by. So for my first function, my initial value is 2. So we'll plot a point on the y-axis at 2. And then that y value of 2, what's happening to it? It's repeatedly being cut in half. So as I move to the right, it's getting cut in half. Which means as I move to the left, it does the opposite. It doubles. Connect the points. So this function that we have here, we'll just say that it is a decreasing function. As x gets bigger, so as we move to the right, the y values get smaller, which is why it's decreasing. The next one, the a value is 2 again. So we once again start at 2 on the y-axis. And then what happens to that y value of 2 as we move to the right? It's repeatedly being multiplied by 4. So my next y value is going to be up at 8. So this function, it's going up to the right, right? As x gets bigger, y is also getting bigger. So this is an increasing function. Let's do two more. This time, the initial value, the y-intercept, is at negative 2. And what's happening to that negative 2? It's repeatedly being multiplied by 4. So as I move to the right, I need to multiply negative 2 by 4, which is negative 8. Notice that point is lower on the function than what the initial value was. 
So this must be a decreasing function. And our last one, initial value is negative two again. And what's happening to that negative two is it's getting cut in half as I move to the right. So it's gonna go from negative two to negative one to negative a half. Notice those points are getting higher as I move from left to right. So I can see if I connect these points that this is an increasing function. That's the end of that lesson. Make sure you download a copy of the practice questions from Jensen Math and give them a try. Jensen Math.